Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, you know, thank you very much to uh, the OWASP Foundation and AppSec USA for, for having me along. Uh, pleasure to be speaking to you all today and uh, looking forward to a quick and exciting session. Um, my name is Casey Ellis. Uh, the talk today is on time for a change, why it's more important than ever to revisit the CFAA. Um, before we get into that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I am not a lawyer. Um, the lawyers that have given input to the projects that I'll discuss here are not your lawyers. This is not legal advice and no lawyers were harmed during the creation of this presentation. So, you know, what we're going to be talking about is a, is a, a, a fair bit of um, kind of content and material around the legal frameworks that exist around good faith security research. Uh, you know, and what we've tried to do is create tools to make, uh, you know, improvement in that area as easy as possible for everyone, but you should always seek your own legal advice. So getting that part out of the way. All right, who is this guy? Uh, my name is Casey Ellis. I'm the founder, chairman, and CTO of Bug Crowd. Uh, I've been in information security for about 20 years. I've been, you know, monkeying around with computers and hacking things my entire life, but uh, started the uh, the career in InfoSec straight out of high school. My career arc is kind of um, interesting in that it started off, you know, just intrigued and, and messing about with stuff. Um, I turned that into a career in pen testing. Uh, and then moved across into the dark side, getting into solutions architecture and sales. Um, at some point, that kind of back of house experience and the front of house experience got together and conspired. I got it in my head that I wanted to be an entrepreneur um, and, you know, did that basically, um, you know, went off uh, and, and did the uh, did the startup thing. So, you know, as a result of that, um, you know, very, very proud to have pioneered the crowdsourced security as a service model. Uh, starting Bug Crowd out um, in 2012. Uh, we're an American company. I'm actually usually based in San Francisco. I'm actually in Sydney, Australia, as we record this, hiding out from, from COVID, uh, but normally based in San Francisco. Um, but started the company from here, uh, moved across to SF in, in 2012, launched our first programs in 2012. So, you know, having broken ground in the space, you know, at that time, it was an incredibly novel concept. But, you know, today, eight years later, as we talk about it, it's something that's far more broadly accepted. Um, you know, I'm an Aussie, I'm a husband, a father of two. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm based in San Francisco normally when it's not unprecedented times, as it were. Um, so just quickly, what is Bug Crowd? Um, <clears throat> really, you know, the, the, the genesis of the idea was out of running a pen testing company, a combination of running a pen testing company and, and seeing the need for human creativity to be applied to cybersecurity problems. Like when you think about what we're trying to do, it's, it's a creative problem set, you know, software development, software creation, the deployment of systems, that all involves human creativity. Um, it's not a technology problem at its root. Uh, the technology just makes it go faster and makes it more impactful. Um, when you think about the uh, the adversary, you know, they're, they're creative as well. So really the idea behind Bug Crowd was this idea of, of So the concept behind Bug Crowd was really how do we take the latent creativity and the latent potential that exists in the white hat hacker community from all around the world uh, and, and actually plug it into where the problems exist and where questions need to be answered in, in the cybersecurity market right across the board. Um, you know, the whole idea that kind of got it going was, was seeing, you know, bug bounty programs, the likes of, uh, you know, Netscape and Google and Facebook, you know, kind of making that concept popular at the time or, or at least making it, kind of a thought about idea uh, and, and something that people are starting to consider. Um, really what we've worked on ever since is this idea of not just facilitating vulnerability disclosure and bug bounty programs, but really like plugging every available person who wants to do this type of work into the problems that are available for them to actually connect to, you know, solve and, and then obviously earn money and earn a living from. So that's what we do as an organization, uh, bug bounty programs, as you would know them um, in terms of public programs, um, you know, crowdsource penetration testing, attack surface management, and vulnerability disclosure programs. And that fourth piece is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So let's get into that now that my spiel is done. Um, so agenda, past. How do we get here? When we're talking about um, the legalities and, and really the legal kind of backdrop to good faith security research and, and making the internet a safer place. Like what's the backstory? Uh, the present, where are we up to? I'll talk about some data that we've gathered out of the Disclose.io project and a few other things and just talk about kind of the current state of conversation around uh, legal frameworks and so on. 
And then the future, how do we improve? Um, you know, what I'm what I'm going to do at that section of the talk is actually talk you all through the Disclose IO project itself, um, which is you know something that I'll I will not preempt right now. But that's basically something that you know I know OWASP has an incredible and a rich history of you know basically turning security into a team sport. Disclose IO is an open source project, uh, and and hopefully this will encourage a bunch of you to either adopt what's going on there or actually contribute and help out. So let's do that. All right, how did we get here? What is the CFAA? Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting one. I've got the, uh, I had the hackers backdrop before I, I changed it to usual suspects because it didn't quite fit into the frame. But uh, as we're recording this, it's the 25th anniversary of the hackers movie. Um, this is another, you know, hacker classic war games. Um, the interesting thing about this movie is that uh, Ronald Reagan actually saw it at Camp David, basically kind of freaked out and, and went back and uh, spoke to the DOJ and a whole bunch of anti-hacking law was the product of that. So, so the CFAA that we deal with today was really the product of Hollywood. Thanks, guys. Um, and honestly, at the time, it was actually, I think, a, a fairly appropriate measure because the internet back then doesn't look anything like what it looks today. Um, so really that's, that's kind of, you know, the backstory of how that law came to pass. And, you know, the challenge with it is that there's been some evolution of, of the law itself over the past, where, where are we up to now? 35 years. Um, but not a whole lot. And, and what we've seen, you know, alongside that is this incredible acceleration of, of the engagement of good faith security research as a part of the internet's immune system and the way that it, you know, keeps itself safe and understands where its issues are so, it, so they can be fixed, all of that good stuff. The law is basically trailing behind that. So what do we do about that, which is kind of what we're going to go through today. So in terms of backstory, I'm just having some trouble advancing the slides here. So in terms of backstory around you know, bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure, in 1995, Netscape launched the bugs bounty program. Uh, they dropped the S later because it's cleaner. And yes, that was a social network joke for those who missed it. Um, you know, there's been uh, like the idea of basically putting uh, rewards out for people to, to you know, test security systems. It's, it's been around for centuries. Uh, people used to do it with locks prior to the internet and the, and the technology industry showing up. But, you know, Netscape's broadly accepted as the, the first technology bug bounty as we know them today, right? Uh, in 2008, Google and Facebook started off their programs. And really, that was when there started to be a bunch of noise generated around this idea that kind of broke out of the, you know, the, almost the echo chamber of, of, you know, vulnerability research uh, prior to that point in time. At that point, the rest of the security industry started to sit up and take notice. And some people in technology outside of security started to understand what was going on as well. Um, really, you know, that's where kind of I got involved in this stuff from a, a, a commercial and a career standpoint. Uh, you know, having been involved with the hacker community for a long time prior to that, seeing the intrigue, frankly, that uh, organizations were, were kind of showing around this idea of just being able to access the talent you know, the entire talent the internet has available to be able to help make them more secure. And this idea of like, if we're trying to outsmart an army of adversaries, then having access to an army of allies makes sense. So bada bing, bada boom, you've got, you've got bug crowd. Um, and about a year into that, we, we noticed a couple of things that were pretty interesting. Um, you know, as we're, as we're basically trying to make vulnerability disclosure and bug bounty programs easy and, and, you know, connect these two very different groups of people to have a productive conversation. Uh, there's a centerpiece of that, that whole kind of interaction um, that is the program brief and the legal language that exists within the program brief. And we noticed a couple of things. It was, you know, the first I think was the fact that like the legal teams that the companies that we worked with at that point in time, this is still true today, aren't used to the idea of inviting hackers to come in and poke around this stuff. Like we've got, you know, 30 years of technology law that's basically focused around the idea of saying, no, go away. And now we're trying to find ways to say, hey, if you're helpful, um, yeah, that's okay. Like, how do we do that? So the the legal teams in general just weren't quite sure how to approach um, this whole thing. Uh, and lawyers have a tendency when they're uncertain to basically 
trend towards verbosity. They'll they'll write war and peace, and that's their job. They're actually doing the right thing from from a legal standpoint. But the problem that that creates is that the hackers on the other side that are trying to read and interpret these briefs, you know, half of them are English as a second language. Not very many of them have a legal background. There's basically almost like the EULA problem that you have with, you know, iTunes or installing an application on your computer. Like you, you should read it. Ideally, you know, everyone would read every EULA before they accept it. But the reality is that people tend not to. They'll either gloss over it or completely ignore it, right? And we saw a similar thing happening with what we were doing. This is a problem because, um, you know, the whole idea around the CFAA is that if you're, you know, we'll get into this in a second, if you're touching a computer or if you're interacting with a computer in a way that you haven't been authorized to, to do, uh, it's potentially a felony crime in the United States. And the thing about that, this is not just about the CFAA, it's actually about equivalent anti-hacking laws that exist all around the world. So, okay, that's not great. Um, what is the CFAA? It basically pre prohibits behaviors that exceed authorized access to a protected computer or the accessing of a protected computer without authorized access. So you're either exceeding or you're touching something that you just haven't been told you can touch in the first place. Um, the challenge with the way that this law has been written and, and the way that it's phrased is that protected computer is incredibly broad. It, it was actually intended at the time to cover government systems. Um, but the way it was written, it was anything that's communicating across state lines or internationally, which is pretty much every computer that's on the internet right now. So it brings everything into scope that someone else's computer or that you know has the ability to to connect to the internet. And why I call that is it is different from from uh, you know laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where it's more about the software that you can actually hold in your hands. That's more relevant to things like IoT and and so on. So okay, there's that. And then this whole idea of authorized access, well, if I'm doing security testing, exceeding authorized access is probably one of my goals. So how do you, how do you make that safer for the people that are actually trying to, trying to do that in good faith and actually try to help make things more secure, not uh, act as an adversary in, in, in doing all of that? And I think the challenge with the CFAA, you know, since it was instantiated, is that it really is being used? Um, you know what what we've seen and and what we've heard from you know people like the EFF and and the Department of Justice and so on is that when it comes to actual prosecutions that make it in front of a, a judge and jury, the CFAA tends to be used correctly. There are examples even recently of of ten thirties that have been prosecuted. Um, they do tend to be folks that. You know, in context of the conversation we're having right now, it's not a security researcher that's, you know, kind of stumbled into something that they've then been pursued for. It's usually actual, you know, criminal behavior or, or things that, you know, are, are alleged to be criminal behavior. Um, the challenge is that it, it really does create this chilling effect around security research. I'll give some examples of how that, how that plays out shortly. It's less about whether you actually get you know, vanned and, and, and the books thrown at you from a legal standpoint, it's more around the fact that that's possible. Um, that's the thing that is chilling and has been chilling to security researchers for a very long time. And there has been plenty of examples where the CFAA has been used. I'll give a few of those in a moment. So, you know, we're thinking about all of this stuff as bug crowd, trying to, you know, trying to grow as an organization, trying to basically change the perception of hackers from, just being, you know, burglars to also, you know, potentially being locksmiths in the eyes of of the industry, and that part I think has actually been quite successful. Um, at, at this point in time, you know, hackers, there's still a, a stigma and and you know work to be done there, but we've gone from being the default bad guy to being potentially helpful, which I think is actually pretty pretty cool. Um, but really, we were looking at all of that and we started asking ourselves, how do we make it easy to do this well? Like if we're trying to create briefs that are legally complete, that you know address both sides, that are easy to understand, how can we make this easy to do well? Um, so in 2014, we released the Open Source Vulnerability Disclosure Framework uh, in collaboration with Cypher Law out of DC. Um, you know, at the same time, the ISO standards were being released. So there was a few a few people kind of triangulating all on the same problem, which was awesome. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, what we saw was the OSVDF 
being basically copy pasted and translated into different languages. And that original language is kind of everywhere now at this point, which is really how this works. It, you know, what we observed was the idea of like prior art and copy pasta, you know, legal templating and boilerplating was, was fairly common. It was something that legal teams and people trying to stand up these programs were actually doing to, to make those things work. So that was an interesting data point. Uh, in 2018, Amit excuse me. In 2018, Amit El Azari started hitting the uh, the talk circuit, talking about Safe Harbor. Um, Dropbox launched their Safe Harbor clauses in their program, and and really what we started to do in context of Bug Crowd and the OSVDF was collaborate with all those folk and try to figure out how we can like how do we blow this up? How do we make it easy to do this well? How do we do that together? Right. Um, in 2018, we decided, yep, yeah, okay, it's time that we actually spun this out into its own its own project, its own brand, its own you know, potential organization. We're actually pursuing 501c3 for Disclosure right now. Um, and we basically you know, took our project, Legal Bug Bounty and a few other things and brought them all together into the, the, into the Disclosure project itself. Uh, and in 2019, Bug Crowd started adding this language to programs by default. We've seen it adopted elsewhere as well. So, you know, going back to this chilling effect, like 60% of good faith hackers don't submit vulnerabilities for fear of legal retribution. So these are people that haven't necessarily been prosecuted or even necessarily arrested. They've just had, um, you know, negative interactions with organizations uh, or, you know, they've, they've heard of others that have, that have had those sorts of interactions. And they're not submitting vulnerabilities. They're not actually participating in their capacity to make the internet a safer place because this law is so ambiguous. Um, if you're a good person doing things that just kind of wander a little bit off into territory that could be considered a bad thing, and you end up working with a company that's having a bad day, that's not a good thing. So this is a, this is a problem that we need to solve. An example of where this actually happened practically, um, Kevin Finister is a phenomenal guy, uh, knows all sorts of incredible things about uh, the security of drones, and he did a fair bit of work on the DJI bug bounty program. Um, and when I say a fair bit of work, some of the vulnerabilities that Kevin started to identify and, and pass across to DJI started to make them a little bit concerned. So they, they were unhappy and and basically trying to chill and control the security research that kevin was doing um i'll i'll you know make these slides available so you can actually read this letter it's it's quite a read it's it's actually very threatening it's you know talking about all sorts of legal action coming from all sorts of different places including you know the use of the cfaa in a federal context you know basically accusing kevin of a felony crime um None of that stuff should have happened in the first place. Like the the fact that that they'd gone out and actually put together a bounty brief and got it out there and invited this input would have suggested that this is probably not something that's going to happen. It happened anyway. So again, the question becomes, how do we make it easy to do this well and avoid situations like this? Avoid chilling the input of people like Kevin into making the internet a safer place. So that's backstory. Um, the present, you know, in terms of where we're up to, <clears throat> I think the thing that that really drives a lot of, you know, acceptance and acceptance in a way that rolls up into the reformation of, of laws, um, it goes to adoption. It's like how, you know, I mentioned just before how, you know, hackers have gone from being the, the kind of the boogeyman to, to being, you know, potentially helpful to being even invited and celebrated by, by you know, all sorts of different parts of the internet, which is, which is a fantastic thing. We've seen a bunch of other stuff in terms of the adoption of you know, this whole kind of core concept of vulnerability disclosure and actually inviting input from the outside world, which is what I'm gonna go into in this section. Um, <clears throat> as a part of Disclose.io, we have a, a tool set uh, called the, uh, we call it DIOSTS. We haven't figured out if we should acronym it or just use it as a word, but DIOSTS will we'll do for now. What that's doing is actually going out, you you basically feed it. It's a, a Go script um, that you feed input and it goes out and checks for the presence of a security.txt file. 
uh, passes that file, you know, dumps out the format into JSON that's compatible with some other components of Disclosure that I'll get to shortly. And it's pretty interesting what we've seen it spitting out. Like within the top 100,000 websites on, uh, according to Alexa, um, <clears throat> there's 933 of them uh, in total. So that's like less than 1% that have a security text uh, file in place in the first place. And of those uh, 933 programs, only about 50% of them have a policy. Um, that's important because without a policy, all you're really doing is establishing a communication channel. Like from, from Bug Crowd's perspective, and I think this is a broadly accepted um, you know, kind of definition of, of a vulnerability disclosure program at this point, you can have an intake channel, but without a policy, no one knows what's okay and what's not okay. So you have to have those two things together. And you can kind of see, you know, 1% in, in the top uh, 100,000 is actually indicative, I think, of the fact that, you know, companies that are popular on the internet tend to be more progressive and more understanding of these types of things. And that's frankly, you know, our theory for why that's higher than it is for the 1 million, which is where, where it's less than the 10th of a percent. Um, and in the 10 million, it's it's half half a 10th of a percent. So, you know, it's, it's one of these areas where we're seeing, you know, people use these tools and, and, and get these things out there uh, in a way that makes, you know, vulnerability disclosure programs and the ability to actually, you know, submit issues to them identifiable to uh, to the internet and not just the security community, but the internet at large. Um, but there's still a pretty long way to go. <clears throat> yeah, another data point that we've got is is through uh, the Disclose.io list. Um, this is actually a, a tweet that goes out fairly regularly from the Disclose.io Twitter. Uh, and what we're doing there is essentially enumerating the safe harbor status, which I'll get to shortly. Uh, on, on all of the different programs that we've actually got logged within our database at this point in time. So, you know, 973 programs, 141 of them, 14.5% with what we consider to be full authorization, um, you know, 21.5% with partial and, and so on. So, you know, again, there's progress. What we've seen with this number is it's gone up, you know, fairly steadily over time. Um, and it continues to do that. You know, really what we'd like to see is for it to, it to do that faster. You know, with respect to the CFA itself, um, there's some pretty interesting stuff going on. <clears throat> the, the Van Buren case, which is, which is actually currently up in front of the Supreme Court, is an interesting read. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's some, some stuff that happened that you know, essentially, I won't go into that side of it, but really what it's done is actually brought the CFAA into question in terms of how it's interpreted. Um, and that has the ability or the, the potential to set precedent for how it's used in the future. So that got a lot of attention from, from us, from, from you know, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, from the Center for Democracy and Technology and, and so on. We put together what's called an amicus uh, brief, um, which is essentially a friends of the court brief um, where we go in and say, okay, you know, here's what you're trying to figure out with with how you're interpreting the CFAA. Like this is a component of that decision that you probably should consider. Uh, and and that particular brief really does go through, you know, the role of security researchers on the internet. Um, you know, the fact that CFAA has been chilling to to a lot of good work uh, and that it continues to be so. And the fact that it should be narrowed in its definition to you know, make it more focused on actual bad faith actors and, and not catch good faith actors in, in, uh, in its kind of definition and covering. So that was a, that was a pretty exciting thing. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we had a, uh, a vendor by the name of Votes who, who uh, are trying to put elections on the blockchain, um, basically write a brief saying, no, uh, you can't, tell the difference between someone who's who's conducting security research in good faith versus someone who's doing that in bad faith. Um, you know, the CFAA should be broadened uh, to basically have it hinge on authorization. So only people that have been authorized to do security testing in any circumstance should be allowed to do that. Otherwise, it's illegal, uh, which clearly um, I don't agree with, uh, nor did uh, about 70 other security researchers, organizations, some Congress people, and, and others that responded on this, uh, 
on this letter here. So, you know, I think just as a as a practical piece, like this is the kind of thing that's ongoing right now. Like as this goes to air, this conversation around Van Buren is actually going to be progressed. Um, so, you know, reading up on it, understanding, you know, what your um, own viewpoint is, like forming that viewpoint, understanding what that is, uh, but then, you know, doing whatever you need to with it. It's an election year. There's all sorts of different ways that I, I think the input of experts that understand this type of thing can can be brought to bear in order to get a good outcome for, for you know, security research and for the safety of the internet itself. Um, as well as that, we had, you know, signatories, um, <clears throat> Again, uh, by the time this goes to air, we're going to have the ability for others to actually sign on and uh, and and basically agree with the letter, um, you know, from a petitioning standpoint. So that's that's another thing that you can do as a call to action. All right, so cool. This is sort of where it's up to. Um, you know, going back to uh, the, the 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 backstory piece of the presentation, really where we got to thinking as we started. Disclose IO and as that it's that's progressed is you know how do we make the adoption of vulnerability disclosure with best practice so not just have organizations accept the input of security research and actually invite that um, but to have them do that well like have them extend things like you know authorization against CFAA and so on how do we make that go viral and that brings me to the next section of this talk I'm keeping an eye on time here so how do we improve. And this is where I'm going to introduce Disclose.io itself as a, as a project. So really the vision of Disclose.io is, is a healthy and a ubiquitous internet immune system. Um, you know, our, our view, and I think the view of, of most folk that, that work in this kind of aspect of vulnerability management that involves the security research community is that security research is a kind of like the internet's immune system. Like we, we, we run around, we find things that, need to be fixed or need to be addressed. Uh, we work on those things. And kind of the problem that the internet has right now is, is almost equivalent to an autoimmune deficiency or, or disease. Like there's a rejection of, of that help that consistently goes on. And ultimately that means that everything is less resilient, less safe, less healthy. And we wanna solve that. Um, credit to uh, Karen Elizari for, for the uh, internet immune system um, analogy. She did a fantastic TED talk probably about six or seven years ago now um, that actually established that, that analogy. And I think it, it's perfect. Um, so really the way or the, the mission uh, of Disclose.io is to drive vulnerability disclosure adoption through safety, simplicity, and standardization. And I will say again, like this, this started out of bug crowd. Um, at this point in time, there's all sorts of different folks that are contributing to it. It's an open source project that we've actually worked pretty hard to make agnostic to, to bug crowd as an organization. Like bug crowd benefits from this type of thing, because if you know the the internet's more accepting of, of security research, everything we do becomes that little bit easier. Uh, but really, the design goal of, of Disclose.io is for it to actually function independent and and you know above uh, what we're doing as an organization at Bugcrab. So just to call that out. All right. So what are the what what are the components of of Disclose.io? There's the terms that we've put together. Um, and really what they are, they're boilerplates. It's, it's really this idea of you know, being able to, going back to the explanation I gave at the start around the OSVDF, you know, how can we have like good copy pasta on, on you know, bug bounty boilerplate briefs um, that are actually gonna be useful. So it's, it's not something that is like a checkbox and you're done. It's, it's, it's useful from a, a legal standpoint. It's useful from a readability standpoint. Um, and it's easy to access for all sorts of different organizations. We've seen people just copy paste it. We've seen people use it as a foundation for their own framework. We've seen people use it as a starting point for their own versions, um, all of which is, uh, is stuff that we want to you know, see continue. That was like literally the, the stated goal. Um, and you know, on, the, on the right here, um, just to be clear to call out, these aren't endorsements of the project from the organizations themselves. Uh, the reason that these logos are up here, it's the kind of organizations that the people that are contributing this to this project are coming from. So it's not just, you know, Casey, the Bush lawyer and, and, and a bunch of other folk from the hacker community doing this. We're actually bringing in and actually, you know, frankly, fielding interest from, from the kinds of people that can really do this well 
um, from all sorts of different parts of, of, of the internet, all sorts of different organizations, government, and so on. So that part's pretty exciting. Um, when we're putting together the terms, uh, you know, I touched on this before. It's it's kind of hard, um, to be honest, because you know what we have to do is is balance this idea of legal completeness uh, against some of these kind of overarching laws that are very vague and require a fair bit of clarification. Um, you know, how do you make that clarity as complete as possible, whilst keeping it readable and brief, um, and also whilst you know maintaining the safety of the organization as well as the hacker. So as a, as a company that's trying to launch a VDP and, and that wants to do that well, what you don't want to do is put legal terminology out there that says, hey, everyone can come and do whatever they want. Um, and I forfeit my right to any recourse for an actual bad faith actor. Like that would be a bad outcome. So how can you, you know, balance that out to make sure that you're protecting people that are operating in good faith while still maintaining your recourse towards those that might be attacking you for real? Um, it's pretty interesting. Like we've, we've, you know, put a lot of work into this, the, the, the biggest challenge. And I think a, a call for, you know, participation and, and help from the OS community from an open source standpoint is actually around translation and, and making sure that, you know, the legal terms communicate across language barriers. Um, you know, half of like more than half, I would say of, of the hackers that participate in, in, in these types of things that would actually need to read and understand this type of thing, they're not necessarily thinking or speaking in English as their first language. So there's an element of translation that's already in play. And we've tried to be mindful of things like that and how we put this, uh, these, these, these terms together. Um, yeah, so it's a good thing. Uh, and really what we're doing is we're extending it out into uh, you know, different regions different geographies we actually wrote a a, a version that's been adopted um or, or used as a as a foundation foundational template by the uh, state of ohio and uh es and s and some of the other voting machine manufacturers as well around election security and i can tell you that writing a vulnerability disclosure program brief for uh an election system set uh within uh, a state that's that's a pretty interesting thing to do because it's quite a diverse attack surface and there's a lot of players involved so you know it's it's those sorts of problems that we're trying to solve with with these boilerplates that we're putting together and again from an open source contribution standpoint you know submitting prs if there's <clears throat> local language translation that you feel you can do if there's local knowledge of laws you know outside of the us outside of at the moment, there's um, Canada, the US, and the Netherlands covered, um, and we'd love to see more countries in there. So, if you've got, you know, local legal or local language knowledge of of a jurisdiction, and would like to actually translate the terms, please submit a PR or get in touch. That would be fantastic. Um, yeah. All right. Next up, in terms of what we're doing, uh, there's the list. So the list is really it's a, it's a community powered. Vendor Agnostic Directory of all known VDPs and bug bounty programs. Um, it's essentially a big JSON blob that sits on sits on GitHub, um, <clears throat> and really the idea of it is for it to be as as you know broadly contributed to and broadly consumable as possible. We don't want to make it proprietary uh, or you know kind of focused or tilted it in any particular direction. We just want this active, you know, kind of true directory of you know, all of the different places that you could potentially go off and do proactive security research if that's what you're looking for, or if you're looking for someone to actually, you know, submit an issue once you've found one, this can serve that purpose as well. Uh, it's up there in JSON and CSV. Uh, you know, the, probably the big call out with, with the terms and with the list is that they're both licensed under CCA 4.0. So it's it's open source. It's you know free for reuse, for repurposing with attribution. So that's that's kind of the spirit of how we've put all of that together. I think the piece that I get excited about is 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 this one. Um, <clears throat> this is the seal, and and really where we'd love to you know the people that are working on this project and myself would love to see this get to is the idea of the seal almost becoming like the green padlock uh, of of you know vulnerability disclosure and you know, the, the right kind of like legalities and channels and frameworks being put in place behind that. And, and I use the green padlock deliberately knowing full well that that's in the process of being phased out. Like I would love to see that happen. 
for, for, for this to be a thing where, you know, vulnerability disclosure programs and the acceptance and understanding of good faith security research is so ubiquitous across the internet. You just don't even need to say it anymore. Like that would be uh, a fantastic goal. I think a fantastic win for everyone. We're not there yet. So this is, this is what we're doing next. Um, <clears throat> so how we've broken out the seal at this point in time is, is basically uh, a good faith statement, which is uh, sometimes referred to as partial safe harbor, and then a uh, explicit authorization, which is sometimes referred to as full safe harbor. Those two things are really important uh, in terms of the difference. Um, you know, partial safe harbor or a good faith statement is essentially when you read a vulnerability disclosure policy and it says words to the effect of, if you're not a jerk, we won't lawyer up. Um, it's better than nothing. And you know, if you go back to the tweet that I posted just before, um, <clears throat> not you know, the, it's actually in the minority. The the, the number of, of vulnerability disclosure program policies that have even you know a basic good faith statement is actually not the majority of the ones that are out there. So you're doing better than than uh, a program that doesn't have one. If you've got something like this, <laughs> the challenge to it is that it isn't providing authorization like the um you know under the the con the problem with this is that it's not actually providing explicit authorization which is kind of the linchpin term of cfaa so <clears throat> theoretically uh, and if you go back to the dji case with with kevin this is pretty much what happened there um <clears throat> You know, if there's vulnerability submitted or if there's security research that's that's done that you know as a as a organization you don't necessarily like, you can turn back around and say, hey, that was unauthorized, and all of a sudden you kind of back to square one. So, you know, I think the risk of that happening uh, with a good faith statement is lower than than you know if one doesn't exist at all, but it's still incomplete. So that's where full uh, safe harbor or explicit authorization kicks in. And really what that what the deal is there is that you know you've got legal language which obviously is in the templates uh that, that i just mentioned um you know you've got legal language that that explicitly authorizes good faith security research in context of any hacking laws like the cfaa um, but it also provides exemption for any circumvention laws uh which uh, you know, things like the DMCA, for example, um, you know, making sure that uh, if you're doing security research and, and bypassing circumvention controls in a way that could trigger something like DMCA, there's an exemption from that. Um, there's also an exemption under the acceptable use policy or terms of service, um, which is kind of in the spirit of what Aaron's law was trying to, to basically achieve. Uh, you know, the whole idea there is that if you if you violate the terms of service uh, in, in the way that you're interacting with a computer system or a service, does that then constitute author unauthorized access that, that kind of brings you into scope for prosecution under CFAA? Um, so there's an exemption for that. And then just a general acknowledgement of good faith. It's, it's you know, really kind of almost this idea of, hey, like we believe that you're trying to do a good thing. Um, so let's make sure that that's stated and clear. Uh, if you got those things, then <clears throat> yep, that's full safe harbor, um, or that's that's you know explicit authorization in terms of the uh, disclose IO seal. And at that point, organizations that have have met kind of the burden of 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 proof or the burden of you know compliance to either of these two things, um, they can then display that seal, which is when it starts to get interesting, uh, which is what I'm going to get to in the next slide. So. <clears throat> this is where it starts to go viral, uh, and this harks back to the whole the the, the picky in the brain slide um, earlier on. You know, how do we get it to the point where it's not conversations like this one, where people like myself and others in the space are trying to convince uh, program owners that doing this well is a good thing? Like, how do we just make that you know something that that is a is a draw? It's a pull rather than a push. And and really, this is this is how. We're looking at it, and this is how we're actually trying to get this done with Disclosure. You know, an organization launches a vulnerability disclosure program, they're added to the list either because they do it themselves or because, you know, a hacker or a security researcher or, you know, someone who works on Disclosure adds them to that list. Um, if they don't have 
a good faith statement or explicit authorization at that point, they'll notice that uh, because they'll come up with a, yep, no, you don't have that. Um, at which point, you know, the organization is going to go back to the repo and see this opportunity for them to add terms that are going to make the vulnerability disclosure briefs safer. Uh, at that point, safe harbor is, is granted or the seal rather is actually granted to them. Um, they display it. And a couple of interesting things happen at that point. Their customers see it. Uh, you know, the beauty of, of vulnerability disclosure programs, I think, compared with a lot of other security controls that we have, is that your, you know, your grandma or your grandpa can understand it. It's, it's something that's accessible as an idea to a non-technical uh, person because it's basically neighborhood watch for the internet. So, as an organization, if you've got the neighborhood watch sign. Uh, on the front of your website, all of a sudden, your customers are feeling more confident and comfortable in your product as they're rocking up and making a decision whether to buy or not. So business improves. That's good, right? Then hackers see it and realize that this is an organization that's been proactive about making me feel welcome as I'm trying to help them out. So security improves, which is good. Um, the part that I get really excited about, and we've seen this in, in all sorts of different industries through, throughout the life of BugCrowd, is that uh, peer pressure starts to kick in. So the idea of, you know, there being like three banks, um, two of them are running bond disclosure programs with Safe Harbor, the third one isn't. All of a sudden that third one is starting to look a little behind the times and they'll correct and actually work to catch up to, to be in parity from a best practice standpoint with their peers. And honestly, I think that's the thing that we need to trigger, um, getting it to the point where you know, it, it, like vulnerable disclosure and interaction with security researchers isn't the thing that uh, the crazy, crazy Bay Area companies do uh, anymore or, or people that are, you know, technically aggressive and progressive in how they're approaching security. It's just something that is a normal part of being on the internet. And frankly, you're kind of weird if you don't do. Um, that's, you know, what we can kind of trigger with this network effect. And, you know, given, again, the uh, the unprecedented times, it, it feels <clears throat> a little too soon to be talking about it in terms of, you know, viral marketing and network effect. But really, that's kind of what this is about. How do we increase the the R naught of, of, of doing it right? So that's the goal of, of this project. Um, you know, in terms of how the folks that are <clears throat> that are watching this and, and, and participating uh, can you know, be a part of it, you know, start a vulnerability disclosure program if you're in a position to do that within your organization. Don't go off half cocked and just do it. It's something that you need to actually think about and plan out, but like get on that, get on that train. Um, I think, you know, interaction with security researchers is something that everyone who is in the security industry is going to need to figure out how to do at some point in their career. Um, so the choice right now is to be proactive about that or to wait until you need to be reactive with that. Uh, and I think proactive is you know, probably a better choice. Um, if, you, if you're already running a bond disclosure program or if you're launching one, you know, add those clauses, like make sure that there is either good faith or ideally explicit authorization clauses in your brief and join Disclose.io, like display the seal proudly. Um, you know, get to the point where you're not only making hackers feel comfortable, but you're driving best practice in your industry. And you're actually signaling back up to legislators and people that are you know, considering whether or not it's time to reform the CFAA. Uh, you're giving them something to look at in terms of you know, the groundswell support for that idea. Uh, the, that's something that we can all be a part of as a team sport. Um, contributing to the project, uh, you know, we're at github.com slash disclose. Um, you know, hello at disclose.io. Uh, it, it, all of those contributions, you know, there's there's a bunch of stuff that we've got already kind of working that really relies on constant community input and contribution. So, so being a part of that would be much appreciated. There's a bunch of tooling that we're wanting to work on as well. You know, you saw the uh, security.tech scanner. There's other variations of that that we're working on putting together to actually map out the internet. So folks that, you know, particularly can program in Golang and, and, and uh, you know, can work with others in an open source tooling capacity. We'd uh, we'd love to hear from you and to be able to work together on that as well. And then spread the word. I uh, you know I think again, the idea of this movement is to basically make vulnerable disclosure normal. I think of the 
you know, I mentioned earlier on that BugCrowd was the first platform to market. There's at last count 40 or 42, I believe, um, you know, similar to BugCrowd platforms that exist all around the world at this point. That's fantastic. Like, honestly, this is bigger than that. I think it's it's actually making sure that the immune system of the internet can function properly. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that we can all get behind. So to sum up, the CFAA and other anti-hacking laws do continue to chill good faith security research. We're seeing evidence of that. We're seeing things that go wrong, even as recently as this week, um, as, as we record this talk. <clears throat> But, you know, there's been enormous progress over the, over the last eight years. Um, in spite of that, there's still a long way to go. Um, but things are trending in the right direction. So, like, let's all do our part. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for attending my talk. I, uh, you know, again, many thanks to, uh, to the OS crew, um, Vanderaj and, and all of those folks. Um, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to connect. Uh, I am on Twitter at Casey John Ellis. Uh, would love to connect with anyone with questions or, or follow up from this and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.